Well, when I was in the fifth grade, I was introduced to the idea of science fair. And I thought science fair was the coolest thing ever. It was an extracurricular opportunity that dared you to ask, what's wrong with the world? And how can I use the power of science to fix that? So I became obsessed. And I wanted, more than anything, to participate in my school science fair. But I wanted my project to be the best it could be. So I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought. I was trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. And, well, eventually I decided to tackle the issue of recycling. And so what I did was I basically bought this commercial kit that let you take tin cans and turn them into robots. So you can see what that looks like on the right on this slide. So I had such an amazing time making my project. I, I presented it at the school science fair. It was, it was really, really cool. Then in the seventh grade was my next exposure to science fair. This time I worked with a partner, a friend, and we, we built this system. We called it UC, and UC was an acronym for Ultrasonic Eyesight Enhancer. It consisted of this, this device that basically had ultrasonic sensors and a buzzer and was, was meant to act like a uh, navigational aid for the visually impaired. So again, we participated in the school science fair, but this time we also participated in what was, re was referred to as the Waterloo Wellington Science and Engineering Fair, or WWSEF. Now that's our regional science fair, bringing together students from grades 7 to 12 across Waterloo, Kitchener, Cambridge, Wealth and you're basically judged by leading experts in your field from all across the region. And this was really, really cool. I mean, I made so many friends, and made so many connections to the judges, and we won a gold medal. And we were ecstatic afterwards, like the individual on the left. Um, but while I was there, while I was at Waterloo Wellington, I heard everybody talking about something. The next level up, Canada-wide science fair. Now, the Canada-wide science fair, I learned later on, was Canada's biggest science fair. It brought together youth scientists from all across the country, regions from all across all the different provinces, all the different territories, to vie for the ultimate position of best youth scientist in the country. Now you'd be getting judged by industry experts and research experts from, from all across Canada, and I thought this was so cool. It was, the, it was the top seven out of like 300 projects in the Waterloo Wellington science fair that got to go, and unfortunately in my grade seven year I didn't get to go, but I was determined to go in my grade 8 year, so the day back from Waterloo Wellington, I started working on the next year's project. And I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and then by the time I got to grade 8, I built this, and, and I called it REDMA. And REDMA is an acronym for Residential Emergency Detecting Multifunctional Apparatus, which is a mouthful. It's basically just this little system that could monitor the smoke levels, water levels, and, uh, and whether or not there was any uh, fires in your house. And really all that information to a mobile app and a website. And if ever there was a residential emergency, like your house flooded or there was a gas leak, it would send you an email or a, te and a text message. So again, this time I, I was lucky enough to, to win a gold at Waterloo Wellington, but I also won an invitation to go in and participate at the Candlewide Science Fair as part of Team Waterloo in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And I spent a week there, and it was by far the best week of my life up until that point. Um, one, because I made so many new friends. Just competing there was amazing, meeting like-minded youth scientists from all across the country. And to add to all of that, I won a silver medal. And again, super, super ecstatic. Um, but while I was at Canada Wide Science Fair, I heard about the next level. Everybody was talking about this thing called ISAC. Everybody was talking about Team Canada, ISAC, ISAC. So, so I was wondering, well, what is ISAC? And, and when I came back from Canada Wide, I started to research, and it turns out ISAC stands for the International Science and Engineering Fair. And this is the granddaddy of science fairs. <laughs> it is like the Olympics of science fairs. There's 81 countries, over 2,000 students, one week in the United States, and the prizes are insane. I mean, I'm pretty sure one of them involves giving a planet after you. Um, so, so it was really, really cool for and, well, after I heard this. I, I really wanted to make Team Canada. But Team Canada was only sending eight people from youth scientists who'd apply from all over the country. Another thing I learned while I was at the Canada Wide Science Fair was the idea that high school students from across the country could actually reach out to university professors to work on their science fairs. And as someone who loved biology, this was, again, really, really cool to me because biology and labs are like peanut butter and jelly. We just go together. Um, so um, I, I decided that I really wanted to work in a lab. And so I started writing emails to professors, listing my qualifications, asking for a possible mentorship. And I wrote over 100 emails and waited for more than four months. After writing all those emails, of course, I spent some time waiting and waiting. I'm waiting. 
and eventually, <laughs> this is footage of me, no it's not, but, um, and uh, I did get rejected multiple times. And the professors were nice about it. They said in their email, oh, like, you're very qualified, unfortunately, we don't have a lab space, or you're 12 or 13 years old, we can't really take that liability. And I can understand that, I mean, I, that, that, that's fine. But then eventually, after more than four months, and over 100 emails, I got one potential maybe. That was me at the time. And so I sat down with the professor, and I presented a PowerPoint to him, and basically saying, look, like, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I want to learn these lab procedures. Um, I then then maybe come up with my own potential experiment to build off of it. And he said, oh yeah, you can start next week. And so I was, I was super excited. But I forgot one really important thing. Um, bureaucracy exists. Uh, so my, now is when my problem started. Um, my, my first problem was something called a safety report. Now, at the University of Waterloo, in order to work in a lab, whether you're an undergraduate student, a graduate student, a postdoctoral student, you have to put together what's referred to as a safety report. And a safety report basically talks about all the different chemicals you're using, all of their hazards, um, safe, safe handling procedures, etc., etc. And usually, the safety report is 10 to 12 pages in length. For me, as a 13-year-old, they added a whole bunch of extra documentation, which I can understand, but the report ended up being 75 pages in length. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, so, so I finished the report over, over, over about a month, and I took it to my supervisor, and I said, can you look it over, can you help me out? And he looked it over, and he said, yeah, this report is good, you can show it. So I went down to the safety office with my report, and I basically went to the people who were supposed to give me safety approval, and I said, are we good? Can I, can I start working? The following is actual footage from my encounter with the safety office. <laughs> yeah, so that didn't work out too well. Um, they basically kind of laughed me out of the room, said what I was suggesting was too vague and, and that I should reconsider my safety report. So I spent another week, I came home, I wrote a completely different 75 page report, I went back, I asked the same question, and they said, no, you should rewrite the report. So this continued for several weeks, and you get the idea. After more than a year of basically going in, having a safety report, being told that it's not good enough, coming back home, writing it again, going back the next week, I got pretty upset and pretty frustrated, um, and so did my professor, right, because he wanted me to start working too. And so we reached a compromise. And the compromise was that I'd be allowed to work in the lab, but problem two, I wouldn't be given a key. Actual footage of me. No. Um, so, uh, uh, continuing on, now that's an issue because I'm a, I'm a high school student, which means I have to go to school from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., which means if I want to actually work in a university lab, I have to work, um, and what I, what I ended up doing was I'd actually come in at 4 or 5 a.m., work till 7, then take a bus to school, then take a bus back from school to the university, work till past midnight, trying to learn the procedures and trying to learn all the experimentation, but nobody's there at that time except the custodian. So what do I do? Well, I basically, they were nice enough to, to open the door for me, and then I pulled the door open with stools. And that only works for so long. I mean, it just takes one dude to kind of show up and push the stool in and then buy, buy all my stuff and my lunch. Um, so, so that was also unfortunate. Now, another problem was, was this, this idea of, of, of no help or lack of, lack of assistance. Now, because I was working like these, these crazy hours and because I was working in a research group, um, the, the undergraduate students and graduate students were, were helpful at the start, but then as time goes on, everybody has their own projects that they're working on. And so there, there weren't really that many people in the lab when I was there, because I was there in such weird hours. So, so I didn't really receive a lot of help. The way I learned most procedures is by like, watching YouTube videos, reading manuals present in the lab, and then doing the same experimental protocol over and over and over until somehow things worked out the way they were supposed to, as listed in whatever manual it was that I was reading, and that's how I learned, that's how I learned most of the procedures. Now, another problem I used to get is whenever I used to go to a postdoctoral researcher or a graduate researcher or an undergraduate researcher and ask for help to teach me some complicated molecular biology protocol, one of the things I used to get told most often was, you're just a kid. Well, yes, I'm a kid who's asking for help. But, but the, the, the idea of having such a young individual work in a biohazard level 2 safety lab was preposterous. Like, any time I tried to ask for help for like a learning a protocol, this was something that I, that I was told quite often, which was another, another problem. Another problem was, was limited oversight. Again, as a result of the, the, the weird hours, and the fact that everybody was kind of doing their own thing, often when I was working on an experimental protocol, there were very few 
few, if any, people present in the lab. And this wasn't so much of a problem near the end, but more so near the beginning when, when I wasn't really aware of how to handle some of the chemicals. And so yes, I did end up taking a couple of ambulance trips as a result of um, exposure to, to certain chemicals at, at the beginning, which was also unfortunate. Um, another problem was, was lack of communication. Um, and and this, was, this was a result of the fact that in my research group, um, they didn't really speak English that much, except my professor did, and there were some graduate and undergraduate students who did. But that's a problem because when you're when you're in a big group meeting and you're trying to explain what you've done or ask for help or advice, communication is key in research. So that was another issue. Um, another issue was I live alone with my grandma, who's sitting up there, videotaping this all on her iPad. Hi. Um, so 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 she doesn't drive, and I don't drive, or I didn't drive back then. And so basically, I used to take the bus or Uber to and from the university, which was which was another problem. Um, and, and then of course this last problem was was frequently the Achilles heel in my situation, which is the fact that when I was in the sixth grade, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Something I don't talk about often, but I thought, hey, this TED Talks is as good of a time as ever to talk about it. Um, when I was in grade six, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which basically meant that I couldn't eat anything without pretty much immediately throwing up. Um, and that was that was like the Achilles heel because you have all of these problems, and on top of that, you keep running the bathroom to hurl. Um, so, so eventually, like near the end of grade nine, I, I managed to, to come up with this, this theory-based presentation based on all the stuff I had read about, all the stuff that I had learned, and, and I came up with this, this theoretical research overview of what I wanted to do. And I presented it to my professor and his research group, and they locked me out of the room. They basically told me that what I was suggesting was too intensive for a PhD student, let alone a 14-year-old, do something easier. And yeah, that was, that was unfortunate. Um, and near the beginning of grade 10, I reached my breaking point. Um, out of everybody in my life, the person I'm most closest to is my uncle, and he lives in Washington, D.C. And at the beginning of grade 10, I got a call from, from him saying that he'd been diagnosed with renal cell carcinoma. That's kidney cancer. So I remember taking several trips from Toronto Airport to Washington, D.C. and sitting there next to him while he was being treated and he was laying down. And I, I witnessed all the pain that he went through as a result of his disease and as a result of the existing treatments, but he never let me know that he was upset, and he never let me know that he was in pain. He just looked over, looked over at me, and he'd ask, how's your project going? Do you need any funding? A lot of the stuff I did was self-funded, too. Um, as a result of lack of funding that was, present, that was present in the lab. But seeing him in that state, I got, I got the motivation I needed to, to, to power through all of these issues. Now, you might be wondering, well, yeah, that's possible solutions to the issue, but um, you might be wondering, I've shown all of these different, I've, I've talked about all these different problems, no car, crazy hours, no oversight, no money, like no funding, the Crohn's disease, like not being able to work in a lab as a result of your young age, what's the solution? Like how do you, how do you actually get anything done in this situation? And I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> so um, you laugh, but this is actually true. Uh, as my project grew in size, um, I, I had to work in more than just my professor's labs. And so what I did was I contacted the professors and uh, the different departments that I needed to work in. I never specified my age. I just said what I needed to do, and they assumed I was a master's student. So I never said I was a master's student. I just didn't correct them. Um, <laughs> So, so that's how I managed to get access to different departments and different labs under different professors. And, and that's when my research actually started to move forward. I still had all of the previous issues. Nobody gave me a key, but I mean, what are you going to do? Um, so, so I kept working, and I got under the impression that everybody thought I was a master's student. I actually managed to get some, some initial work done. And I worked at more than 12 labs, University of Waterloo, University of Toronto, Rapid Novo, University. I even had someone from the University of Washington helping me out. And it got to the point where, like, the University of Waterloo didn't have enough resources in terms of what I wanted to do, so I had to go to the University of Toronto, sick like hospital in Toronto, because they had the lab with, with the facilities I needed. And so I basically take my samples on dry ice in the car of a family friend, and then drive three hours to downtown Toronto to, to the facility and give them the stuff on the weekend. And they also thought I was a master's student, so we were all good there. Um, <laughs> Now, I've been talking quite a while, quite, for, for quite a while about how I did what I did, but I haven't really talked about what I actually did, what the research actually was, and so I want to spend some time talking about that for a little bit. So this is graphene. Um, graphene is, is a form of nanoparticle, and a nanoparticle is basically just a really, really, really small thing. Now, graphene is really cool. People call it the superhero of material science. Why? Well, it's one atom thick. It's incredibly conductive, it's incredibly mechanically strong, and it's really, really easy to change its properties. And so this is 12 different types of graphene. It's a graphene library, which means different sizes, different shapes, different surface chemistries. Our graphene is really cool, but what did I do with it? 
I applied it in the context of nanoparticle-based drug delivery. Now, nanoparticle-based drug delivery is, again, a very big mouthful. But basically what it means is taking really, really, really small little vehicles and going and delivering medicines to specific cell populations via these vehicles. So it's like really, really, really tiny pizza trucks going and delivering pizzas to specified addresses. That's, that's the idea behind nanoparticle-based drug delivery. Now, this technology has existed for, for quite a while, for quite some time. However, it faces several obstacles with respect to its implementation in the real world today. And it's the same obstacles that impede the success of treatments like chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and immunotherapy. Now, I should mention here that I applied nanoparticle-based drug delivery in the context of cancer treatment. And with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, and nanoparticle-based drug delivery, the big question is, how do we target only cancer cells? Because chemotherapy, radiation therapy, what they're doing is they're trying to kill cancer cells, but they have no way of differentiating normal cells from cancer cells, and so you're killing both normal cells and cancer cells, and that's what's causing all these side effects, hair loss, joint pains, etc. Now, why is it that it's so hard to target just cancer cells? The answer is something called the protein corona. Now, your blood, human blood, contains hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of proteins. These proteins are everything you are and do everything you do. Now, anything that enters your body intravenously, any drug that enters your body intravenously, is going to be immediately covered by a subset of these proteins. And so now, if your drug is designed in such a way to get itself to where it needs to go, after injecting it in, into your bloodstream, your drug is not taking it where it needs to go. It's covered by all of these different proteins. And so, even if you get to your target cell population, which is a long, a long shot, the cell doesn't see your drug, it sees this layer of proteins. And it's this layer of proteins that's taking it away from where it's supposed to go. Now, the analogy I always like to give is it's like jumping into a sticky ball pit. So if you jump into a sticky ball pit and you jump out of a sticky ball pit, you're obviously going to get covered in sticky balls. Anytime any drug enters your bloodstream, it's going to get covered in proteins. It's the same idea. Now, in my project, I looked at past research on the protein corona, and it's the fundamental reason why there's so many off-targeting effects with existing cancer treatments. People have tried to characterize it, people have tried to get rid of it completely, but there's always 2 or 3 percent of that coronal layer left. And so even if there's 2 or 3 percent, that layer is enough to take your drug and mess everything up in terms of targeting. So I asked a very simple question. Can we take this weakness and turn it into a strength? If blood proteins in your body are taking your drug away from where it needs to go, can we somehow reverse engineer that layer of proteins around the nanoparticle to take it to where it's supposed to go? And the answer is yes. Over four years at the University of Waterloo, I developed one of the first ever workflows for building nanoparticle-based drug carriers by specifically reverse engineering the protein coronae around different nanoparticles. Um, the, the total fabrication time for, for my carriers ends up being um, four days. What I did was I combined uh, molecular biology-based experimentation with uh, data-intensive bioinformatics. So you get data about the different layers of proteins, and then you use a computer to tell you specifically how to build that nanoparticle-based carrier based on its corona to get the best overall configuration, where you, you, you build it up, break it down, and then build it back up to your liking. And I applied this workflow, um, and I tested it for the treatment of human lung, breast, and colorectal cancer cells. And what I found was my method ends up being 10 times faster to implement, 7 times less expensive, and 5 times more effective than existing gold standards for cancer treatment. Now, this method is also universally applicable in that it has the, you can, it has the potential to be applied to other diseases, because a big part of it involves computer-based data mining, which means that you could potentially look at applying the same method for the treatment of other kinds of cancer and even other diseases. I mean, it's just a way to get your drug to where it's supposed to go. Now, um, with this project, I was lucky enough to present at the Waterloo Wellington Science and Engineering Fair. Um, this was my board. Uh, I, I won a gold medal there, best in division, and the opportunity to participate at the Candlelight Science Fair. But I didn't go to the Canada-wide Science Fair because, luckily, I also secured a position on Team Canada for the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. And every single one of these projects will blow you away. I made such good friends with the people on Team Canada. I mean, a precision irrigation system for the developing world, turning cancer cells into neurons. I could go on. These guys were all incredible. This is a picture of me in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, at, at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair with my board. It is, or it has been, the best week of my life by far. I met so many incredible people from across the world and still have contacts, people from Australia, people from Beijing, people from like, all across the world, even industry experts who came to judge me. Um, we got to meet Nobel laureates. It was, it was by far the most magical thing I've ever experienced. 
And I also had the opportunity to take my research and compete in the Sanofi Biogenius competition, which is a competition tailored towards biotechnology research for high school students. And I had the honor of winning the regional, national, and international biogenius competitions with my research. Well, um, earlier this year, I had the opportunity to present my research in person to uh, our current Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Mr. Justin Trudeau, and also the uh, Minister of uh, Science and Sport, uh, Mrs. Kirsty Duncan, at the, at the <coughs> Parliament Science Fair, held in Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Um, in December of, of last year, I was also honored and, and humbled to receive my acceptance to pursue post-secondary education next year at Harvard University um, in molecular and, and cellular biology, where I'll be continuing uh, my research. I'm currently looking at publishing and patenting the work that I've done, um, but the message I really want to get across with this talk is that age is not a limiting factor. You're just a kid. Yes, you're a kid, but that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't restrict your ability to do anything. That doesn't restrict your ability to change anything. Whether it's science, technology, engineering, arts, math, whatever it is. You're just a kid. That doesn't mean anything. Once you ignite the flame of innovation and apply the associated sincerity, dedication, and perseverance, there's nothing to hold you back.